Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that uh, somebody's got to get up here and welcome you here. I saw most of you as you came through the door, but I know I missed a lot of you, and it seems like a lot of you say, what's going to happen tonight, and what's this for? And my answer is nobody knows what the hell is going to happen tonight. So this is truly a happening. It's a jazz happening at Dante's. It might be a wonderful opportunity to have a kind of a testimonial here to Stan Kenton. And then, because there's so much business to be taken care of this evening, I think we'll get the testimonial over with fast. I'll make it myself. And I'm not telling you anything that you people don't already know. I think it's an accepted fact that I'm a legend in my own time. <laughs> Music will never be the same because of the things I've achieved and accomplished. I, uh, the musicians, they'll all tell each other, you know, to know me and to work for me is to love me. There's no doubt about that. I know all of those things. I know the influence that I've been on music, and I know the great contributions I've made. And I, I, I don't think there's any reason in asking you people to get up here and substantiate such things that, are, that I already know. How do you do, Leonard? You know, we waited for you. <laughs> of all the people that I wanted here this evening, Leonard Feather. You know, and we, we... I checked with Carrie and Bill and Sonny, my own office. Did you get Leonard on the phone? Is he going to come somehow? Will he be here? And Leonard finally said, yes, he'll be here at 9.30. He wasn't here. I was walking the street out in the back. Where is Leonard? What the hell happens? We call his house. Jane isn't there, but Feather is here. I'm sorry we had to start without you, but I tell you what I did. I gave a testimonial to myself, and I know you would have loved to have participated, but... <laughs> you know, it's funny when you, when you live with a guy half your life, you know, like Feather. I read his columns. I've had musicians threaten to take his life. Uh, Dick, that drink for Feather? Sprinkle a little pot on top, will you? We're going to get him to come clean tonight. This is a party for jazz musicians, and I say jazz musicians because, you know, we are really a kind of a, a different species. We found identity through the music, and we love the music so much, really, I think that uh, we'd work for nothing, and most of us do. We've been termed irresponsible, undependable, egocentric, selfish, disrespectful, drunkards, dope fiends, we're freaks, and we're insane. That's our image. On the other side of the ledger, you know, we have a lot of things that we can be proud of. I, we're all aware of the fact that I think that jazz music is changed music for all time. It really has. Our philosophy of human purpose has affected all of modern society. Our manner of dress and style have been copied time and time again, and the jazz musician's jargon has finally been incorporated into the vocabulary of, of everyone. All of that really isn't bad. I think, however, if we're to honestly look at ourselves as people, we've got to admit a few things we jazz musicians. Most of us don't care about anything but music. And if we're truthful, we love music and our horns more than we do our wives and chicks. <laughs> Somebody said a little earlier here, if we get to talking about chicks, how many wives are here? <laughs> Rosalino said all three of mine are here. <laughs> Getting back to admitting a few of these things, as painful as they might be. You know, when we don't think we're playing well, we're miserable, and we can come up with a long list of excuses, blaming anything and everything. We all uh, kind of dream about being famous and wealthy, but at the same time we say, who needs it? We pretend to love everyone, but if another guy plays better, we secretly hope he busts his chops. 
When we're not playing or listening to music, we're talking about it. We gossip about each other more than the worst women. And when we're at a party, we invariably wind up talking about each other and things that have happened. Is that Benny Carter? I've always wanted to meet you, Mr. Carter. <laughs> how, how do you do? You're sitting there, Sir Leonard Feather. They got a thing going there, the two of them. I don't know. I must say that I'm not going to use the term introduce because I'm sure we all share the same affection, respect, and admiration for this guy. This guy's perception is something magnificent, and I think if there was ever anyone that truly is a symbol of what we might call the creative minds of jazz, it's this next guy. I won't even ask for a reception because I know it'll come like an explosion. What a ball to have him here. Mort Saul! I won't even attempt to... Uh... I want to attempt to uh, follow what Stan has said here. I hate to correct Stan because he's my idol. And, uh, you know, I've known uh, Stan uh, since uh, 1941. He started his orchestra there in Balboa. I was, uh, and then I used to go to see the band when I was going to Compton College after I got out of the Army. I was down in, uh, I served my country. It was old time. A lot of you won't remember this, a lot of the younger people. It was a whole time when people wanted to go into the army. It's a, you may not remember that. You remember that? Nobody was going to Toronto or Sweden. At no temptations of the flesh. People want to go in the army. And uh, not to be in the band. I mean, really to be in the army, you know? So, yeah. so uh, <laughs> the band, you know, Stan's uh, had several bands and... Uh, uh, my uh, my whole scene uh, always was when I was going to college. I used to uh, test girls up. I'd take them to see the Kenton Orchestra, and uh, I, in other words, if they got with it, it was sort of like an intellectual uh, sort of final examination, and uh, that's uh, that's the way I used to do it. A lot of guys did the same thing with me later on. It's part of the Kenton legacy to me, you know. And I would uh, uh, a lot of college boys, if they had a girl they were particularly interested in, she looked like she had potential. They'd bring her to see me, and if she understood what I was laying down, they'd say, well, you know, that's the chick for me. But if they were, uh, when I got to Las Vegas uh, recently, I worked at Caesar's Palace, uh, which is a sort of a compendium of Rome and Miami Beach. <laughs> anyway, so I would, uh, I was in there, and um, there weren't any uh, college boys there. The audience there is more of a, I was uh, following the Xavier Cougat Orchestra there. <clears throat> and... Uh, they have one tune in a library. It's interesting, Stan. They have one tune in a library. They have a big band bus. They have a small truck with the instruments and, uh, that follows them. And uh, a, uh, or somebody trying to attach the instruments following them. Anyway, they have one tune, La Cucaracha, which they, they play changes on, you know. And I used to stand out in the wings waiting and go on. I'd say, I like that, you know. And then I'd, guys would come off. I'd say, what is that? And the guys would pass me with the clavis. They'd say, it's La Cucaracha. And every night, no matter what I'd like, it would turn out to be La Cucaracha. Anyway, so... Um, it's translated as the roach. So, interesting. Sorry. That's not hip. Narcotics aren't hip. If, even if uh, a lot of you, uh, you know, thought you wanted to get interested in narcotics, you'd have to stand in line behind a high school student to make a connection. So, you know, in other words, students have preempted, young people have preempted uh, your habits, your language, and almost everything except your ability. I knew they forgot something. They have no talent, but that's what the heck. Nobody's... Pro All right, so anyway. Uh, so I was in New York last week to uh, do the Dick Cavett show. I do all, all of those talk shows in an effort to inform the American public. And you've seen them. There's several of those shows. That Dick, that all of those shows have a guy sitting at a desk and an orchestra. See, there's union rulings. They have an orchestra. have 38 men sitting there. And the, uh, the guy, usually MC Johnny Carson or, or Dick Cavett or Merv Griffin, always says... I don't know if you people at home know it, we got some of the funny musicians in town here. And uh, you have to take his word for it in that they usually do not play on the program, right? None of them play. And uh, so then the band uh, sits there, you know, and the MC usually taps his thumb there and one and three, so they come out of the commercial. So Dick Cavett has a great band, is a drummer leading it, you know, which is a, not the best idea, have a drummer leading an orchestra. Not the best, no offense, Louis. 
But uh, and I said, drummers, uh, you know, it's a, and also you got to watch drummers are usually kind of insurrectionist in orchestras. Those of you are thinking about starting an orchestra, I think um, the other kind of guys are. Uh, it's not always drummers. Sometimes it's trombonists. Remember in the Maynard Ferguson band, another Kenton alumnus. Um, the um, um, that whenever uh, Maynard would take a break, he'd go off the stand during somebody's solo. When he'd come back, Slide Hampton had taken over the orchestra. So you, right? So, and during that time, during the tune, Charlie Barnett had broken up and formed again. And, right? <laughs> so, and gotten married. So, uh, anyway, Stan, uh, you know when Stan was talking about putting together his monologue, he did that in his office. This was a well-kept secret this evening. And uh, anyway, Stan was at the office, and he has this office, you know, and uh, it's kind of weird. It's long. He has this long office. And uh, he, had a, he had a wide office at one time, and then, of course, there's these various property settlements. So I walk in, and he has a secretary there, and then he has a guy back there who's a copying machine turning out the music for the Kenton Clinics in uh, Redlands, you know, college bands. College bands are always overstaffed because nobody has to make the nut. <laughs> College kids have no sense of reality, carry conga drums and all that. So, <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, when you try to, so I, in planning this party, I was calling him because I'm one of the conspirators along with Shelley Mann and Frank Rossellino and Don Bagley. So we were, I'd uh, call, you know, and I'd get Lee Richards and she'd say, just a minute, the secretary said, I'll go forward and see if he's up there. So. <laughs> She go forward and she'd say, uh, he's in Washington trying to see about your royalties. <laughs> and uh, then uh, Stan goes to Washington, you know, he's lobbying for royalties with Senator Philip Hart. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, he has to go back there. So what he tries to do is take musicians with him whom the senators will understand. So he never, in other words, he doesn't take anybody with him like guys from the cream or any of those people. He usually, you know, takes, you know, people back, like, you know, you know uh, Bing Crosby, people like that, <laughs> who are more readily acceptable to the United States Senate. So, <laughs> say, Stan, why don't you take some rock musicians? He says, no, it's got to be guys like Bing. <laughs> I said, why? He says, ham and eggs. They're like, ham and eggs. <laughs> so I never question him, you know, I accept everything he says. So anyway... Then you can't get Lee. So if you can't get Lee, then you got to get the supervisor of the clinics, Dick Shear, the road manager. I say, uh, Lee, can I talk to Dick? I say, well, just a minute, I'll see if he's back there. He's on the Xerox machine. I can't disturb him. <laughs> Playing. Then I, uh, well, who else is there? It's, there's all these various people there. So uh, you can't ever reach anybody. So I call Stan. I say, I can't ever reach anybody in your office. So he'd always say to me, well, uh, a lot of people here building empires, Mort. <laughs> We've all got empires. So I said, who have you invited? So he said, well, I've invited all these guys. And he had all these guys that had worked on his uh, band. You know, his... So I said, why don't you get some names? So um, we started uh, trying to get some composers. We called a lot of guys. I invited Andre Previn. I haven't seen him come in yet. And um, Stan has all his albums in the office. There's three albums there. One in back of Stan in the bookcases. One is called Like Young. That's the memorial album. <laughs> like blue and the third one is called like the others <laughs> interesting anyway so, well <laughs> so anyway yeah you know being around him is a very strong influence you know he's very sure of himself and i mean anybody that would take the neophonic in with one day of rehearsal you know is obviously either has a sense of abandon or self-assurance so uh, and i know i've been there right into downtown los angeles fearless Onto the freeway and into the right, over the center divider and into the music center. So uh, the people at the music center don't know what you're playing anyway. You know, they just want to get dressed and go in there. And as D. Barton himself pointed out, if they really want to build a music center for the people, they should build it at Coldwater and Magnolia. <laughs> and Mrs. Chandler banished them for saying that. So he's not at the music center. He's here. And uh, D is interesting. It's... Uh, uh, interesting guy. He started here uh, with his band 14 months ago. So the first time he came in, he had uh, 20 men here. And then uh, the band kept building. Toward the end of the year, he built a rock band within the band. And the rock band had four men in it and amplifiers. 
and a technician from Pacific Gas and Electric. And a... <laughs> then it grew to 25. Now the next time they're coming in, it'll be the last Sunday, right, Dee? Last Sunday of the month. There'll be 28 men. They're going to add voices. And um, a lot of people have come up to me and they said, uh, how do they get 28 men in that club? You know, because you're sitting here in relative physical luxury here. But, you know, when he's up here, you can't get anywhere near him. You know, he conducts very physically. <laughs> Sense of leadership, you know, follow me. So, uh, 28 men. So, uh, you know, I, uh, he uh, talked it over with Carrie and Bill and Sonny, and they, they said uh, they'd go ahead with it. So uh, it's about even. You know, it'd be 28 people in the audience. There's room for 28 at the bar. And uh, the 28 guys in the band, I used to walk up to Carrie, and I'd say, how can you make it? Because I'm interested in the underpinnings of our business, financial substructure. And uh, he'd say, well, it's good in this case because none of our customers drink as much as D. Barton and his orchestra. <laughs> Interesting point. Anyway, so those are the kind of things that go on at this club. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the, uh, those are a couple of the things. What else happened? Oh, uh, it's a lot of people walking in tonight said to me, what is this thing for tonight? Stan is announcing his candidacy for governor later. <laughs> <clears throat> of Alabama. Now, we're, uh, <laughs> the bar. Jeez, we had a great day. Uh, we were over at A&M this afternoon, by the way. There's a whole gay round of parties today. Uh, we had the, uh, t the end of the Tijuana Brass. They had a party like this in which they shared all experiences over the years. We were there between 4 and 4.15. Right? And then <laughs> we'll tell you about some of the legendary figures some of whom worked in the Kenton band, such as Zoot Sims, who is now at the Half Note in New York. And uh, he walked off while I was there. He's professional, but he demands that you be professional. And I had gone in the Half Note, and I had ordered a meatball sandwich. So they brought me the French roll with the three meatballs. While he's playing, one of the meatballs fell on the floor, so he walked off. I was on. Anyway. Zoot. So, Zoot used to be on... Uh, on Stan's band, and uh, Stan and he got along great. At that time, this would be very hard for some of you younger guys to get with, those of you who wear scarves. <laughs> and otherwise appear not as if you are in an orchestra, but in the peace movement. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, commando. What is it called? Mandate. Tony Martin was. Anyway, so Stan used to come in. He always wanted guys to have handkerchiefs at that time. He used to carry Kleenex with each guy in the band. And um, he had um, Zoot Sims just used to wear white socks Stan could never get with. And um, Stan kept apologizing, which is very difficult for him. You know, he's not, he isn't that kind of humble guy. He's a leader, you know. And he'd have to go to people like Saul Hurok at Carnegie Hall, and he'd say, uh, Saul Hurok said, why is that guy wearing white socks? Stan would say, actually, that's the band uniform. We ran out of them for the other 19 guys. <laughs> so, you know, so... Uh, finally... Zoot came out there and he was wearing those kind of mittens, you know, where your toe sticks out. I mean, on his feet. And he played great, but, you know, Stan watches all that stuff. When he, you know, when he, you've seen that, haven't you? He's been on the band, he patrols his sections. Walks up and down with a flashlight. You know, walks to the end of the trombone section, you know. So, uh, so anyway, and Zo finally Stan uh, gave uh, Zoot a, 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 a um, I guess you might call it a mandate. And he said, no, he, he gave him an order. He said, you've got to wear uh, black socks. So uh, Zoot came in that night with his ankles painted black. <laughs> and uh, something to think about, Stan, in a changing world. So uh, anyway, now I'll be, so listen, I'll be back to see you later. And uh, our subject later on this evening um, will be uh, the stratification of the races in jazz. Let's take this thing on head on. And um, if it goes well here, there'll be a jazz festival up in Monterey, and we may get a panel discussion going. And we'll find out whether there is any prejudice. I'm, the real test of prejudice is who you plant the stuff on when the band is busted. <laughs> we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you. Mort, don't waste it.
Shelly Man. Shelly? You know, I really don't want to be up here alone like this because, uh, you know, you follow Mort Saul and someone as dynamic. I think you said that, Leonard. Uh, as dynamic as Stan Kenton. <laughs> you don't mind if I stay here as your aide de camp, do you? No, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to I'm gonna see ask you, you up here. Listen, is it true that uh, you once called being a percussionist with Stan Kenton the same as chopping wood for a living? <laughs> no, that was a, a misquote. Uh, <laughs> I didn't say it was chopping wood for a living. I just said... <laughs> Oh! <laughs> That's different, you know. But you know, there are, there are funny stories about a lot of guys in the bit. You know, Art Pepper, who was a member of Stan's band years ago, and of course other bands, but Art Pepper had his own group. He went out on his own. He was playing in a little club down here. I think it was called the Sandbar uh, here in Los Angeles, and it was terrible business, you know. There was just no business at all. And finally, the club owner came up to Art and said, uh, it's too bad that the business is not good, you know. And Art said, yeah, I can't understand it. You know, I have a lot of fans, but just business is rotten. And the club owner says, well, you know, man, it's Lent. And Art said, uh, are they still making that scene? <laughs> you know, and, well, you know, there was... Uh... I was just going to remind you about Chet Baker. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Same thing with Chet Baker. Right. Carry on. No. So, well, Chet this. was when he was living in Italy, uh, was going to do a record date with uh, Benito Mussolini's son, who was not an untalented guy. No, uh, uh, a jazz piano player. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he got to the date and they met, you know. And somebody said, uh, "Chet Baker, I'd like you to meet Romano Mu Mussolini." And Romano Mussolini, I'd like you to meet Chet Baker. And Chet Baker said, "Hey, baby, sorry to hear about you, old man." <laughs> <laughs> But he, re he really thought, you know, he was... I mean, he really thought he was saying the right thing. You know, what are you going to say to him? Uh, uh, Stories of true believers. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, yeah, another odd pepper story. Hit it. Mark mentioned before the Innovations Band. Well, you know, when the Innovations Band was on the road, we had so many guys in the band, there were two buses to carry the whole band. So one bus had a clique of guys, and the other bus had a different clique. And the one bus was called the balling bus. What did that mean? Well, that mean that everybody on that band was, oh, yeah. I see. you know, like that. And the other bus, you know, we'd go to sleep. And, and things like that. Practice a lot. Yeah, so, so one night, you know, Odd Pepper sneaked on. He was on the balling bus. And Odd Pepper sneaked out of the bowling bus and got on the other bus, you know. And we were driving along, <laughs> to get some and rest. at the first K stop, which is the rest stop, uh, Art got off the bus and went back to the other bus. And he said to the guys, do you know what they're doing on that bus? And everybody said, Ma, what are they doing? <laughs> Art said, they're reading. <laughs> Well, you were with the Innovations Band. Yeah. How many men? 42 on the road? I never counted the other side of the orchestra. <laughs> you know, the... That's important. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is they played behind the beat, man, which is really a drag. <laughs> <laughs> They're, uh... <laughs> Shelly was the... The band had, well, had Carlos Vidal with you. Yeah, right. When you did that, what, that Hollywood Bowl concert, I heard you swear in Yiddish once, bilingual swearing, so you wouldn't offend Stan. And, uh, but all of those, all those violinists knew what was happening, the Jewish intellectuals. But uh, it was always saying to the other side of the band, the 17 string players there, they kept uh, threatening to throw the concert. It said Norman Granz had bribed them. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. A lot of you don't remember Norman Granz, the interesting guy. He used to live in Switzerland, even though he made his money here. A lot of us resented it. You know, a lot of us are strongly pro-American, which is an unpopular position. And, uh, and, it's a, you know, and then he sold his record company and then lived here all the time, which I never could figure out. He's here all the time now, if any of you want to see him. And he's often confused with Gene Norman. There's a guy who used to 
helps Stan a lot. And he used to see the sign when you drive along a Sunset Strip. It would say, Gene Norman prevents Jess. Right? <laughs> and, uh, uh, anyway, Gene, I worked with Stan every Christmas at the Crescendo. And uh, Stan would have these younger bands because after 1951, a lot of the guys would stay in the valley, you know, writing. So, you know, writing out, you know, these farmed out charts. So, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, Stan would have these kids, you know, he had these kid bands. These kids would come off the boat, you know, with the note from their parents, go in his orchestra. So we were working at the Crescendo, and uh, I had Maynard Ferguson on the band, you know, who couldn't get a card here. So he was with a band as a specialty act, you know, he'd sit there in a brown suit, which was not it then. Sure is now, <laughs> but it wasn't then. The other guy said blues. Anyway, so, um, and uh, Gene Norman was there. So uh, I came to work, and uh, Stan uh, introduced me. I couldn't go wrong, you know, he sort of ordained me. A stamp on the back. And he used to have Maynard Ferguson play, you know, this introduction and then stand and say, here's this guy who's going to mess with your mind. And then I'd get up and talk, you know. So then I did very well that one night and uh, Stan used to walk up to me. never understood Gene Norman, you know. He'd say to me, uh, you know, I've known this guy many years and uh, there doesn't seem to be any shape emerging. <laughs> so, so Gene Norman had a radio show. You remember that? The East Side Show. The great diction, this guy. So uh, I did so well, you know, hanging around with Stan. You can't go wrong. That Norman offered me, that was my first job here. I was making $400 a week at the club. So when the show was over, he said to me, because uh, he was a radio guy, he said, I'd like to talk to you about further employment <laughs> with the club. So um, actually, he talked slower, but we don't have too much time. <laughs> <laughs> so we drove down to Dolores Drive-In at... Uh, Wilshire Boulevard and uh, La Cienega. And they ha it's automated, you know, there's no uh, car hops there because there was charges of uh, homosexuality and all that. Anyway, so people trying to get into movies and all. So they got speakers there. They got these little speakers like it, it, the old jukeboxes. So Gene Norman was sitting there in a the car, KFWB artist, and uh, the speaker, you know, the guy says, Order, please. <laughs> so Norman says to me, he says, what would you like? So I said, I said, a cheeseburger and a cup of coffee. So the guy's really getting hot now, you know, he says, order, oh, please. <laughs> so Gene took the speaker off the mic and cleared his throat. So, <clears throat> Good evening. <laughs> Good. It's this great, great lunch. As they say. Unbelievable. <laughs> On that note of nostalgia, just remember that, you know, we have a fine heritage here that Shelley's Manhole and Dante's are direct derivatives, descendants, I should say, of the finest jazz club of all, no offense intended, the paternal, descendants of the paternal crescendo. Remember their slogan, all you can eat for $100. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what a ball here to have this next guy. I love him. Rosalino, thank you. Yes, Dan. Oh, my God. Baby, where's your mic? You got a mic? Uh, no, uh, 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 somebody take it from me. <laughs> so what's happening? I mean, uh... Well, uh, <laughs> Frank, you know something? You were here early. You've been circulating all through the place. You had one of those microphones in which you go to pick people's brains. We want to find out what brains you've picked. Well, I've um, picked a few brains, but um, uh, they weren't working at the time. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you mean you didn't, you didn't find anything alive, Frank? Well, not too many, baby. Like, uh, you know, like, um, they, didn't even, they didn't even know who in the hell I was, you know? <laughs> And you, and you didn't tell them, did you? <laughs> Hell no, baby. Then you I got a cop play. out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've been seeing a lot of my buddies here, you know, from the, um, Bob Cooper's here in June. And, yeah. How's and, it seem uh, to see old friends? Oh, just great. Does it? Yeah. They look just as old as I do. <laughs> 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 no, it's really um, great to see them all. And, uh, and, um, I think you're trying to pin me, baby. <laughs> 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 and, 
Alveola's over here with his charming wife. Yes. And uh, who else is here? Well, I, I, there are a lot of people here, Frank. If yeah, there is. I, I, like I, I just don't recognize him. him. Jimmy you Jones. You didn't recognize him? Harry Sweet Edison is... Uh, is Harry, Harry Edison is, uh, here? Yeah, he's here, wailing over there. Harry. Hey, Sweets. Sweets. <laughs> Harry Sweet Edison. Come up, Harry. Come on up here, baby. Somebody. Yeah, tell us about your first night in the Basie Band. That's right. What I happened? Took a little walk. I'll be with you in a minute. Thank <laughs> 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 you. Hey. When I first joined Count Basie's band, mm -hmm. uh, as you know, we we read very rarely. You know, because <laughs> in fact, it wasn't nothing to read. You know, everything was like you go into this room and trumpets go into this room and rhythm section go into this room, saxophone section go into this room with late, great, Lester Young. And the bassist said, well, we're playing B flat because that's about the only key that he played at B flat or A flat or D flat, you know. <laughs> So we'd go in and uh, we'd come out with an arrangement. So after about 10 years, I said, well, look, man, I'm not making no kind of advancement in this business. <laughs> I'm going to learn how to read, you know, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. I said, this is no way to make a music career, you know, just playing a this, you know, and every night We'd grab, uh, the, I'd grab the repertoire and put it in my pocket. <laughs> and next night, Prez would grab the repertoire and put it in his pocket, you know. And basically, he'd grab it. And that's all we had, you know, about 10 arrangements, that was all. So they had uh, been with Benny Moten, and they knew what they were playing. I said, well, man, gee whiz, you, you haven't got no music here, and I just think I'll quit because I want to learn how to read, you know, what the hell. He said, well, hell, you're playing your ass off every night. <laughs> <laughs> said, what, what, what do you want, you know? <laughs> still ain't got nothing to do with the part that I want to, you know, see. <laughs> so he said, well, if you hit a note tonight that sounds all right, play the same note every night. <laughs> <laughs> There's two words you can use. <laughs> well, I said, well, I'm just reiterating what he told me. He said, well, if you, you know, they end up on a note and you hold it, you find this note tomorrow night, and it's, it sounds good, you know, play the same fucking note every night. What the hell? <laughs> Don't make no difference. Well, that was the height of my career for about 16 years. <laughs> Playing the same fucking note every night. <laughs> My man, uh, I think you had a little set to there with him one time, King, when he was playing a, a medley, and uh, and everybody would look over and say, well, uh, certain key, basically, you know, and you'd modulate. So Benny Carter, one of the giants of the business, as everybody knows, he said, uh, whispered and told basically, says, uh, all you think, all the things you are in D natural. <laughs> And if anybody knows music, they know that's pretty mean and denatural. <laughs> in fact, anything is pretty mean in that key, you know? <laughs> so, Basie says, uh, mm -hmm. if you get that, you'll be all the mothers you are. <laughs> 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 Frank? Yeah? What's it like for a guy of your musical prowess to have the stimulation of sleeping on the Steve Allen show every night. <laughs> it's a wonderful, relaxing feeling. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I feel if, if the price is right, you know, why not? You know, pack out. What is uh, he really like? 
Uh, Stevie? Steve. Well, I, I never called. Well, there's no question about it. Uh, Steve happens to be one of the greatest pianists in the world. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> How would you uh, contrast his legitimate technique with Stan's? Well, I would say it's, um... Um... Uh, Stan has much longer fingers. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it has more soul, you know what I mean? <laughs> We'd like to introduce another guy here that is one of our favorite guys, one of the most colorful guys that we have around in this field of music. I asked him a moment ago if he'd mind coming up, and he said, no, if you'd like, I'd be delighted. So we are delighted. This is Med Flores. Med! Yeah. You've been talking about the bus and the trains and all that jive, man. Like, didn't you ever work on a band where they drove in cars? <laughs> now, all the bands I ever went, they couldn't afford a bus. They, uh, like Thornhill's band, it was always cars. And uh, I went on that band right out of college, and I, I w had a minor in sociology. You got that? <laughs> huh? I thought you were you could put a chart Eh... No, no, I'm a sociologist, really. The coefficient of correlation and all that job. I'm hip to all that, Mort. You're not the only one, you know. Just because you walk around with yesterday's newspaper in your fist, that don't mean nothing. You dig? This cat, this cat walks in here with a tie on. Do you believe that? <laughs> You're among friends, Mort. Yeah, I know. I know <laughs> now I understand why you never wore a tie before after seeing that one. Yeah. That's good. Oh, Jesus. That's terrible. But anyway, in the olden times, the Stan, I always aspired to play on a, a, a great uh, name band like yours with, uh, with like a, a bankroll, you know, where you could afford all that. But uh, on Claude's band, it was cars, you know, and uh, after you, you drove 300 miles to a gig and you played the night and got smashed, then you got back in the car and you drove another 300 <laughs> miles. And there wasn't no bus driver up there going like that, you know, Bob, with uh, Rossellini uh, mapping out the Rand McNally and all that. We were on our own in the wilderness. And uh, it got kind of rough out there sometimes, and we would get new cars. We drove to Pittsburgh and we got new Buicks. This was in 19, uh, <laughs> it was 1950 or some weird year like that, man. And we got these brand new Buicks. We had all the legit cars. We had four cars and Claude, and, uh, and we had the junkie car, you know. And all the junkies were in one car. And uh, when we left uh, Pittsburgh, like the speedometers were at zero, you know, and, and we went out through, uh, uh, well, you know, we played all those, uh, uh, what was the guy, Archer Ballrooms and everything like that, and then up to Sioux Falls and out, out over to uh, Rapid City and then down to, uh, one, uh, to uh, oh, what's the town, uh, Cheyenne, and then down to Denver and then out through to all, you know, all that thing. And then out west, and then uh, the Palladium, and then up north. Oh, it's that Pacific Coast Highway. It was Red Kelly, the first week we had it, he ran me right into a log truck, man. <laughs> well, anyway, we got back, and we went, uh, we got back to Pittsburgh, and uh, we checked in our mileage on the cars, and, and the cars, and I said, well, what do you got on your car, Jeff? That was Jeff Massey. Oh, oh I got 26,000, and O.B. Massingill had 25, seven, very conservative. And uh, then we came to the junkie car, and these guys had 42,000 miles on their car. They never slept. Yeah. They always knew somebody a couple hundred miles away, I and mean, they could get screamed. And, and then reached the point, and then I finally got demoted to that car. I don't know why. It was nothing I did, I want to assure you of that. But, uh, and every, nobody was, had anything, and they were on pills. They knew this nurse in uh, <laughs> some town, I forget, and with the two and alls and the nimitols and everything. And they had a bunch of Dexies, and, and I was in there, and I was a college boy driving the car, you know. And they would, like, 
I did a lot of driving in those days, and these guys were cacked out in the back seat, you know. And uh, so we were driving, and we were on our way to Waycross, Georgia. And uh, all of a sudden, and we were drinking, and you get a bottle of Coke, and you pour it half out and fill it up the rest of the way with Seagram 7. That was, that was Red Kelly's idea. It was a terrible thing. But we drank them and, and all these things, and they lost count on me, you see. I was the driver, and they were supposed to keep me straight. But uh, the heavies, the downers exceeded the uppers by about six to one at that point, you know. And I'm driving, and all of a sudden, uh, the nor- we had to stop the car and get out and look at the northern lights and all that giant. You know? <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and so uh, I, I, I fell down in the middle of the road, and I, I kind of fainted, sort of. And I'm looking down the, the, the line in the middle of the road. My eye was right on the line. I'm looking down this long, long line when I woke up, and there's this semi coming, see? And uh, so these guys, all these bad cats, man, they, they, they drag me out of the way of this, of this truck, and it whoosh, goes by, and uh, they stand me up straight, and they slap me in the face hard. Boy, that really hurt. And... Uh, They said, you all right? And I said, well, yeah, man. What's going on? Yeah, sure, I'm all right. So I turned around a couple of times, and uh, I went to get back in the car because I was in bad shape. And and these guys had all gotten back in their original positions, man. They were so far out that even though I had just fainted, they trusted me more than them. And I had to drive the rest of the way to Waycross, Georgia. (laughs) 